Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Gaurav Mohan. I work as a solution architect with HCL Technologies, and yeah, I'm based out of Netherlands. Uh, so yeah, uh, most of my time I work with the accounts to design and uh, develop solutions on .NET and Azure Cloud. And uh, I'm also an uh, Azure uh, Certified Solution Architect, and uh, I've been coding in C# -sharp for almost uh, 14 years now, and uh, that was. Uh, yeah, my first programming language I started professionally coding, but yeah, uh, I started with C and C++. Uh, that's that from where I learned my fundamentals of programming back in my college days. Yeah, but anyhow, it's been a long way since then. And uh, but during the last few years, I've gained some interest in uh, developing distributed uh, cloud native solutions. And what we are here to talk today is gRPC, right? And uh, you know and how to get started with it in .NET. so just to give you a brief uh, we will cover what is gRPC what are the benefits of it especially in the microservice architecture and we'll be definitely seeing some code in the end right and so we'll be uh, seeing uh, you know how to uh, build a backend gRPC server and a gRPC client in .NET. but yeah but before we jump to into gRPC right uh, just uh, you know, take take a look at what are the different pillars and factors, right? Which hold priority when we are designing a system. There, of course, of course, could be many more which are there in the slide in this presentation. But yeah, but these are the you know few ones which strikes our mind, and uh, we we try to build our system in accordance to these parameters. So we like we want a system to be reliable, you know, and 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 perform it. Uh, you know op operations correctly irrespective of what are the operating conditions and we again achieve this by tackling each specific area like to have uh, no single point of failure creating backups have redundancy of different components and thus making a fault tolerant and uh, resilient system uh, similarly uh, there are these other pillars as well like our system should be able to scale for uh, any uh, unpredictable usage patterns or a surge in traffic and this also makes sure that our system is future ready and you know it's, it's capable to uh, you know expand uh, uh, when we have you know more more traffic on our system then maintainability of course is another area we want our uh, efforts uh, the maintenance efforts to be minimized during future growth and when we are adding uh, more features to the system uh, and but then when we comes to performance right and this is also uh, the area where grpc is also targeted to improve the response time and efficiency of communication uh, between uh, two services and, and and especially in a microservices architecture wherein there is a lot of uh, chattiness you know goes around between the services and uh, we want to make sure that we are able to maintain our desired throughput and performance of the application Okay, so going forward, yeah, what is gRPC? So gRPC is an efficient, uh, high-performing remote procedure call framework developed by Google back in uh, 2015 or so. Uh, and RPC is not something new, right? It's, it's been there uh, even before REST came in. Uh, so basically, we can call a remote service as if uh, it's a part of the uh, local calling service. Uh, but what, what are the benefits of gRPC? It's that it takes inherent uh, benefits of as it runs over top of HTTP2, uh, thus providing the streaming capabilities and uh, cover the request by making fewer TCP connections. So if we compare this with REST, right? Uh, gRPC is contract based, so the client need to have the right contract before communicating with the server. And uh, in different tests, right, uh, it, it has come out that gRPC has come out to be high performing than REST-based APIs, which are communicating to JSON. And uh, yeah, and, and because uh, the another reason is gRPC takes the benefits of binary serialization. Right? So, so the data which is getting transferred across the wire that is in a compact form. And that is also the reason why the messages uh, or the data which is there in gRPC flowing around that is lighter than JSON. And we will see this comparison in the coming slide that you know how, how uh, uh, data in a in a binary format is more compact and in a lesser size compared to JSON. Um, uh, we do have uh, uh, browser support also on uh, gRPC, but uh, gRPC was never designed uh, to be consumed directly from the browser because it is contract based and 
uh, uh, the the gRPC client, you know, it, it it has to be set up before communicating to the backend gRPC service. But gRPC web it is something a uh, uh, JavaScript based client side library, right, and which acts as a proxy layer which can run in your application in, inside the browser, and uh, it will proxy your request from the browser to the backend. All right. Uh, Moving on, right? We, we talk about HTTP2, right? So uh, uh, the uh, benefits of HTTP2, which it brings to gRPC, right? And, and even before going into that area, uh, when HTTP 1.1, you know, came in, you can basically send a large message to the destination, and uh, you can basically, you know, open up one single connection and uh, keep it open in an idle state and reuse that connection to send multiple requests. Uh, but the only downside is that the request, you know, uh, can uh, only go one after the another. So, like, if you have to send three requests, right, it will go, and uh, it, the, the the previous request has to finish in before the next one can go. But with HTTP2, it, there is a concept of streams which came in. So basically, we can uh, group all the related messages and uh, pass it on to the receiving side as a stream. So over a single uh, HTTP connection, right? Uh, we can send three independent requests. So let's say we have one request to update a database, one to receive some data from the database and something similar of this kind. So over the one connection, all these three requests can be sent concurrently and uh, thus providing significant performance improvement over HTTP one. So what's a gRPC server and a gRPC client, right? So the server, uh, the gRPC server will create a contract, something similar uh, if you're coming from a WCF background. Uh, there will be a service and RPC method uh, which the server will be exposing. And uh, the same contract has to be uh, basically sent to the clients for the clients to interact, right? So, uh, and Protocol buffer is one of the ways right, uh, to create the contract and uh, generate the definition of your gRPC service. Uh, but we will learn more about uh, protocol buffer in the, in, the, in the coming slides during our presentation. So basically what we see over here that we have a centralized gRPC server, which is like, which could be created like in, in this case, a C sharp uh, service created in .NET 5. And we have two different clients uh, created in a different uh, programming language, one which is in Java and the other one is, is, uh, is in C sharp. So uh, our contract uh, that is completely uh, independent of the programming language uh, uh, we are choosing, but yes, uh, the clients which we are getting, which, which, which we are creating, right, it could be in, a, in a, any different uh, programming language. So gRPC has a support for uh, all the major programming languages, right? And uh, uh, there are compiler tools available for each of these to generate uh, platform specific boilerplate code. And this code will uh, be used as uh, the uh, as your assets and your classes to basically uh, uh, create your gRPC server and the client. So we have, we, the, the support is there, I mean, for all major platforms and uh, the programming languages. So gRPC calls, right? I mean, uh, uh, these are uh, the different gRPC calls uh, which are supported. Like if we talk about unary RPC, which is a uh, standard single request and a single response kind of a call, uh, just like what we do in uh, in calling a REST endpoint. So basically, there will be a RPC request to the server from the gRPC client and uh, get that response response back in uh, in a binary format. Then we have uh, server side streaming, you know, wherein the server can, you know, establish a connection and can a stream of messages to the client. And uh, the client will keep on, you know, reading, uh, uh, read all these messages until, you know, uh, the streaming has been completed from the server side. And similarly, there is uh, this client side streaming uh, in which the client can stream the messages and wait for the server to. Uh, you know, to, to read them and provide a response. And this is particularly useful in cases of uh, mobile and IoT devices, wherein you stream the data from the client uh, uh, 
uh, constantly to to the, to the server and in bi-directional streaming the client and server can send uh, the messages to two different uh, streams at the same time and uh, the streams are totally uh, independent of each other and and uh, and here and and they implicitly maintain the ordering of messages in uh, in, in in their individual streams okay so let's uh, talk about protocol buffers or uh, it's called as proto buffs uh, we talked about this communication in gRPC, right, happening in uh, binary format and uh, protocol buffers, they provide a way for uh, efficiently serializing and uh, deserializing your uh, structured data in a binary format. And it is language and platform independent, so you can serialize the data in, uh, uh, you know, in, in one programming language and deserialize in another. And it is significantly less uh, compared to XML and JSON, and and, and it significantly helps in uh, conserving your network bandwidth and thus providing better performance. Like, let's say if we talk about XML, right? So XML is space intensive, and uh, and a complex XML is not easy to understand. And and although JSON has the advantage of being more readable, but yeah, when it comes to the size and performance, yeah, uh, protocol buff. Uh, uh, uh serialized data has the extra edge and then uh it there's a backward and forward compatibility which inherently comes in because uh, uh, the way the uh protobuf have been syntaxed and uh, the way we have uh, the numerical sequencing of number which are you know, tagged to uh the identifiers uh, all, the, all the properties which are there on the server side and this is something which we which we will see uh in in, in the demo as well right so uh, all the previous clients uh, for gRPC, they need not to be updated because if the new fields are added, they are identified by a sequence number. And basically they will continue to work uh, with the uh, existing uh, contract, what they have. So, but yeah, but what's wrong in that case is with JSON, right? What's missing with JSON? Uh, because it is it is text based, it is readable and easier to understand. And uh, if we give this JSON to right to a, to a non technical person, he will be able to understand what this means. Right, he will be able to make out that what this data is all about. And of course, there are tools right uh, to work with JSON which are well uh, matured now, and JSON has become the industry standard. And most JavaScript based UI frameworks have already you know, proven their capabilities to run stable workloads in production. But if we can do a comparison right, between between a JSON and a protop of binary serialized data, uh, we'll be able to figure out uh, what are the uh, added benefits of that. So uh, I created a, a, a .NET, a, a very basic .NET web API to do this comparison. And uh, it has a simple get method, right? And uh, uh, there is this employee model, which has been created and all these prop uh, properties have been populated. And uh, when we make a call to this rest endpoint, right? And uh, we see this response, right? So the total response size is 271 bytes, which you see here, right? out of which uh, the body or the content length, which is our actual JSON, which is coming, that is uh, 97 bytes and the headers in itself is 174 bytes although all of these are the default settings and uh, we can get or get rid of few of the headers but still uh, but if if we, if we only talk about let's say even 97 bytes right on even if doesn't look that extensive uh, but when we are building uh, scalable systems right and uh, so the, the, the this content size the size of uh, data which is transmitting over the wire, it will have uh, you know, significant impact, uh, you know, if we are targeting a high throughput of our application. So one way to do the comparison, right? Uh, there is uh, a NuGet package available by ProtoBuffNet, right? And if you are coming from WCF, you will be able to, you know, uh, familiarize with the coach which is there on the left side right like like similar in WCF we have those data contract and data members so we have decorated our model uh, with a data contract and a data member uh, 
uh, with a proto contact and a proto member. And uh, as per the uh, proto buff syntax, we have even tagged all our fields and our properties in the sequence number. And uh, we, when we, uh, you know, populate this uh, model and we use serializer, which is again coming from protobuf.net, we serialize this data and, uh, you know, generated a binary uh, serialized. We encoded it in a binary uh, format and we have written it to uh, the text file and save it to the disk. And this is the exact same data which we saw in the JSON in the previous example. Okay, so what uh, is the comparison, right? Because when we compare the raw size of the JSON and the binary serialized data, we can see a tremendous improvement, right? When, when it comes to the size uh, yeah, using protobuf. For uh, like for JSON, it is 124 bytes and uh, for the uh, uh, protobuf, it is, yeah, it is 35 bytes, which is, and the difference is approximately four times. And we are not even talking about uh, GRPC yet. So GRPC yet, and uh, let's say we are storing uh, this data, right? This and there is a bunch of data which we are uh, storing in, in in a storage medium. We will be able to save a significant uh, storage cost as well. Uh, to to take an example, let's say in our architecture we have a mem cache or a redis cache to store this data and there's an api basically you know which is uh, getting this data from cache so let's say in your production uh, instant production environment you are using 64 gb cache instant cache instance and you're saving save saving json in there so you can straight away bring it down to 32 gb right and i mean just just an example and and if you're saving your data in a binary format uh, so you will get the improvements in terms of infrastructure cost plus the benefits of transmitting fewer bytes of uh, your data over the network. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it's always be uh, fruitful yeah, to do your own experimentation based on the use cases uh, which we have and you know try to bring uh, some similar metrics and do a quick, you know, uh, performance check, which we can get uh, with gRPC over other uh, technologies and frameworks. Okay, so uh, here is the example of proto file, right, uh, which has an extension of dot proto. And uh, uh, proto file is, uh, is a platform and language independent uh, definition file. Uh, uh, the syntax which you see here, uh, this defines your version of uh, the syntax of the protobuf syntax which we are using. Uh, like proto3 is the latest version of uh, the syntax which is there, right? And it already includes proto2. So if in case you don't, you know, if you take this out from your uh, protobuf file, by default it will pick up as proto2. But yeah, it's advisable to use uh, uh, whatever is the latest syntax, which is Proto3, which is available. Okay, and uh, then we have this options uh, tag. Uh, it defines the optional data for uh, uh, you know the gRPC tool, the .NET gRPC tool to work on because this proto file uh, will be used uh, uh, by the compiler and it will create your boilerplate code corresponding to your gRPC server. And uh, uh, so basically, this parsing is going to happen for this proto file, and uh, you know all the plumbing and all the artifacts will be created and those will be created under uh, this namespace which is grpc service uh, then we have uh, the package and then we have uh, service right so service defines your uh, actual grpc service to which the clients are going to connect to and uh, uh, and, and and we have defined uh, two uh, grpc stubs or methods here so your grpc clients will make a call to the to this rpc stubs and get the uh you know the response back uh 
then message is something uh, you can say which is similar to a model class like an employee class which we uh, saw in the previous uh, slides uh, so here we have a message by the name of employee with uh, all the properties uh, defined using uh, the primitive uh, data types right and uh, you also see this uh, numerical uh, sequence which uh, you know which we, which we touched base upon earlier and uh, it is mandatory and important to have uh, these sequence numbers as this is how the fields are represented uh, you know, internally in the binary and the basis of which the encoding and decoding is going to happen so as such because the data is in the binary format so there is as such no significance of these field names which you see here and uh, by giving them uh, the uh, these numerical representation that's how it, it it it's going to be you know preferred and picked up now in a binary format and this helps in uh, uh, creating the backward compatibility as well so if any time you know you know you want to add a new field just add a new one uh, with an increasing sequence number uh, yeah but that's uh, it's designed to you know to restrict uh, the developers you know so, so that the backward compatibility uh, uh, is is maintained uh okay so th there is this message right and uh, which is intentionally i have left it as blank the reason is that if you see this particular stub uh get all employees right and i am not expecting to pass any parameters to this but how the uh, proto syntax works is that you need to you need to uh, you know send send in a message uh as an in input parameter because uh, the reason is again because of the compatibility right because once this is generated as a contract uh, right and let's say we don't although it's not possible to to not pass in a parameter but yet let's say if there is a possibility to create a stub without any parameters and if later point of time you want to add a parameter you are going to break uh, all your previous clients so for that reason we uh, the pattern is like you even if you don't have to specify or uh, you know have an input parameter you always send in a message uh, as as a blank message just to make sure that you know if in later point of time you want to add some uh, parameters to this stub you can you know straight away add this to this message uh, then one more example which you have is the repeated keyword which is for the representation of embedded uh, messages so in our case we have this uh, 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 upper uh, collection employees which will have a list of uh, employee message right? this some, something similar to a list or an array then uh, we have some uh, unknown and uh, conditional messages right and i will quickly touch base upon on this uh, like any is used uh, basically to uh, embed a message into another message but we don't have to specify in the dot proto file what your embedded message is going to be so basically when we are creating your service you can uh okay in any of the messages you want to your uh you know to, to your any field and it is not available by default so you have to import uh this particular dot proto file google proto buff any dot proto for that and uh in, in fact there are you know uh, other similar definitions as well uh especially specifically talking about c sharp like let's say if you want to work for date time time span there are respective dot proto files so you can basically import it and uh use it to create your dot proto file so that when your uh, compiler runs it transposes it to the respective date time and your time span object uh, there is this one of uh, keyword yeah it is uh, used to specify uh, one of the messages out of the available list like in our case we have a vehicle as a uh, as a, as a parent object and uh, we can choose any one of it when we are uh, creating an uh, instance of it and use either a car or a bike and uh, plug it into the result then uh, value is uh, something similar to uh, your c-sharp dynamic type it can be of uh, any type like a string a number a boolean a null whatever you want to 
define it uh, when you are creating uh, the gRPC service, right? All right. Uh, now coming to uh, .NET 5, right? We have talked about gRPC, but uh, uh, how you know uh, .NET 5 is going on uh, with uh, gRPC and the improvements it has recently brought in. So this is a community community benchmark uh, which was performed on .NET 5 gRPC, and uh, there is a significant performance improvement noted for gRPC server, which is 60% uh, uh, faster than the uh, .NET Core 3.1. And for gRPC client, yeah, it's even higher. But again, this is a community bank park, right? And uh, we can always do our own analysis. We can do our, you know, create our own metrics, our data based on the requirements what we have, and see for ourselves, right? You know, what uh, are the performance improvements we will get in our use cases? Okay. All right, so let's do some demo, right? So in this demo, we are going to cover the .NET 5 gRPC server and the gRPC client. Uh, we'll not be covering uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the all the clients in here, right? Uh, because we'll be focusing on creating a, a, a .NET 5 based gRPC server and a client. So just to give you a brief, so in this scenario, uh, there are these multiple clients which connects to uh, the, uh, uh, the to this data aggregator service, and uh, uh, the data aggregator service, you know, can connect to multiple backend service. In our case, uh, we have created only one service for now, but basically, its job is to make a gRPC call uh, and fan out the request to the services to different services, get the data aggregated, and uh, uh, send the respond back to their client. Yeah, so let's uh, jump to Visual Studio, right? And let's see how we can uh, build our gRPC server and create a gRPC client and make that talking and communication happen. Uh, okay, so before we jump into it, yeah, so uh, if you want to create a gRPC based solution, right? And uh, you should have uh, the uh, desired template available in your video studio. So you just uh, go create a new project and there will be, if you have a template available, you will be able to create a gRPC ASP.NET Core service for that, right? But uh, for this demo, I already have the service with me. Uh, over here. So what we have, what we'll get by default uh, by by the template is a Protoss folder, and inside that we will get a, a, you know a, a sample uh, dot proto file. But uh, in our case, we have this company dot proto, right? And this is the same proto file which we uh, saw earlier in the presentation. It, uh, so and one thing uh, I would like to uh, point out here, like if we talk about this stub, right? Get employee for employee ID, right? It is accepting employee as a message type. But if you see it, this method, right? It is expecting an employee ID. So why did we not have uh, something like this, right? We could have uh, done that as well. Uh, the reason in the reason is again uh, in t it is uh, uh, syntax based so this is something which is uh, not allowed so we cannot pass in uh, direct data types as an input parameter to your gRPC methods and this is again to uh, you know have that compatibility in place because the moment you have your uh, uh, message object inside your uh, parameter, you will not break your previous clients if you add one more field to it. But the moment you add, uh, you know, employee ID, and at later point of time you want to add one more field, right? Your all your previous clients are going to break. Uh, okay. Before uh, going further, let's see how uh, the project file of this yeah looks like. So if you see that uh, we have the protobuf include tag, right, and uh, include protos company dot proto and we have a grpc services which is uh, set as server this means that uh, once the dotnet tool for grpc will run on it right it is going to create that boiler 
separate code for you uh, in accordance to uh, uh, in accordance to, uh, to to the gRPC server. And that uh, gRPC.NET tool is currently a part of your gRPC ESP.NET code, so we don't have to explicitly include it in a in a new get package. But if you have to if, if we are using a client, then we have to uh, include it as a reference. All right, so going back uh, to uh, the code again. So uh, yeah, so once we run the code, right? Once we build the code, so basically the gspc.net tool is going to run onto it, and uh, basically it is going to create uh, these two files for us. And uh, this is some, something uh, similar, like right? uh, in WCF, like what you used to have an SVC util utility utility, and we create all those contracts with the command line tool. Uh, it is yeah something uh, similar in that uh, nature. So if you go to uh, this company.cs file, let's go to this one. And uh, one thing uh, which we'll notice here is that it says that it's generated by the protobuf uh, compiler and do not edit. And because the moment you edit it, it is going to be uh, not in accordance to uh, the uh, proto file which we have here. So if we kind of you know mess up with this one and we send this uh, proto file to our clients, then uh, there is a mismatch of contracts which is going to happen. So yeah, there is a lot of uh, boilerplate code here. Uh, one thing uh, which I want to point out, right? So the, the, the message, the employee message, which we saw over there, right? So it has been created as a model, and we will see all those fields being uh, implicitly created, right? And we can basically use these fields in our uh, GRPC service, which we'll be creating, right? And and it, it has those tagging the name, uh, the numerical sequence number of the tags as well. Uh, then, if you go to com uh, this company gRPC.cs, right, uh, and uh, again, if we scroll down, right, uh, it, it has created a base class for us, right, and this is something which we will inherit, inherit to uh, when we are creating our actual service. And uh, you can see that it has, uh, you know, uh, created uh, two uh, virtual methods for us. Some uh, the similar methods which are our uh, which which were there in our dot proto file. And it is in an unimplemented state, obviously, because yeah, we have to implement it when we create our service. All right, so let's go to, uh, so in our services folder, we have company info service, right? And uh, we can see that it is coming from uh, the same base class, right? Which we just saw. And uh, I have uh, uh, a logger here and an and implementation and uh, overhead, overhead enough a method, get employee for employee ID, just one of the methods, right? For now, for this demo. And uh, it is going to accept uh, that uh, employee as a request. It is going to create that model, populate the properties, and it's going to, uh, yeah, return it back. And if you go to your startup file, uh, it will be have the configuration and uh, middleware to use uh, gRPC, and there is a mapping for the service which we created, right? All right, so this uh, solution is uh, yeah already yeah running on my uh, on my system. So if we try to it is like it's, it's listening on this port, and uh, if we try to hit this URL, yeah, it says that communication with GRPC client must be made through GRPC client, and this is a bit obvious because. Uh, the browser does not have a gRPC client, and this is now how it is expected to even work. And in the scenario which we saw, right, we have this uh, aggregator service, and and the the client has to be created in that service itself uh, to basically communicate with this endpoint. So we go to uh, another solution, right? This is the uh, aggregator service, uh, the main service. Uh, which we uh, saw uh, in, in the slide. And uh, one thing I want uh, to uh, point out here is the gRPC client, yeah? This is something which we created 
and uh, it has uh, the dependency on these packages for uh, google.protofuf grpc net client because it's, it's a grpc client and grpc tools uh, which will be used to basically to parse this uh, protofile which we have then in similar convention right we have a protos folder and we have uh, the uh, this protofile in here uh, now uh, it is up to the uh, organizations and teams that you know how they want to you know basically uh, uh, send this profile to their clients right there could be many different patterns right some organizations yeah, they prefer to uh, host it internally in a url right you can also publish it in git or create a portal for it and you know and have your clients download it from there but yeah but it should be in accordance this contract should be it should be in accordance to what is there in the server and if there is any mismatch to uh to, to you know to, to the messages or to the fields or to the exposed service or stubs then uh the client is going to get some exceptions so yeah so once uh again once we build this tool right it is going to create all those uh, c sharp assets and classes for you so we have uh, one uh, client class in here uh, which has a construction constructor injection to get the server address from uh, the uh, calling application then uh, based on that uh, server address we are creating a grpc channel uh, and the channel on which the uh, connection will be established to your uh, grpc server and uh, once uh, you know this client is created right we, we create the the object and send uh, that grpc call uh, to to the server and we get the result back right and for this demo that we have serialized this data to the json because our uh, on, on our consuming side we are we are going to hit it from a browser uh, and we are going to see uh, the json uh, response right uh, so at the consumer side right we have a simple data aggregator controller right it is uh, basically going to call and create your client and pass on uh, the uh, the the host name of your grpc service which is running on this port basically get basically get this data and uh, pass it on to uh, uh, to the browser right so if we yeah go to this uh, uh, particular application the data aggregator application right and uh, if we hit this url yeah it is going to create a client for us and uh, it is going to give us a response back now if we go uh, back to our server right and uh, we'll be able to see that what request came in right and on an http2 yeah we have this request on company info for this particular uh, uh, grpc method and uh, we have the type application slash uh, grpc yeah. It, yeah it took 252 millisecond because we hit a breakpoint yeah and that's why it's taking yeah, this uh, uh, much of time um, another thing which i would like to quickly point out is uh, but unfortunately we will not be able to cover that in, in the interest of time but uh, we have the concept of grpc web as well so which adds uh, the support to make uh, your grpc calls uh, directly uh, from the browser so in dotnet there is a support so you can include the package uh, grpc.aspnet core web and uh, basically registered this as a middleware uh, in your startup dot cs so that way you uh, and and then you have if let's say you are making a call from your uh, uh, from uh, you know let's say an angular based application you have to basically include your uh, grpc web client into your application and then make this call so that call is going to be get proxied through grpc web and then it is going to grpc server so that way yeah there is a uh, the data exchange which is going to happen between your browser and between your server that will be in a binary format in a compressed uh, format yeah so uh, that's what i wanted to show in the demo so in the summary uh, what we saw is that we created an ASP 
gRP, .NET gRPC solution, right? And uh, we uh, created a dot proto file and uh, with the service definition and the messages. And uh, we also saw this uh, gRPC tools, uh, which runs and uh, creates the C sharp assets and uh, this code for your services to be created. And uh, we created a gRPC service. We uh, and we uh, we have overridden all those base methods and created a one-over implementation of uh, the respective uh, uh, of the of respective methods. Then uh, we created a gRPC clients using uh, the same dot profile which we used to create a gRPC service, and uh, and in the end we basically made and. Uh, RPC call using uh, yeah using using REST API yeah and that completes uh, my session uh, I wanted to show that uh, the uh, uh, the gRPC website is <laughs> well but yeah in the interest of time. Uh, Possible. But yeah, the intention was to create yeah how to get started with uh, gRPC in .NET, and uh, anyhow, it's it's a first class support provided by Microsoft. What it means is that uh, the Microsoft is actively contributing to it to make sure that uh, you know the community is able to run their production uh, grade workloads. Yeah, that's it from me. Thank, Thank you, you all for much. listening in. Thank you very much, Gaurav. Thank you. It's, it's been really insightful. It was a very good work through, uh, from my perspective, through the gRPC uh, concepts. And then we've got time for like a couple of all right, three questions. So the first one, I'm just shooting now. What are the differences between gRPC and WebSockets? Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So a WebSocket is something. It's a connected. You know. Uh, it, it it it's a. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's kind of a connected uh, connection between your browser and your server basically you established and connection and you basically you, you know stream your messages right but uh, uh, the, the the good sides of grpc which we get is the uh, binary serialization right using uh, protobuf and uh, although two way communication i mean whosoever has asked this question it's a, it's a really good question because in G websocket also you can do your uh, streaming and uh, you can do the bi-directional communication, right? But with gRPC, when it comes in, it takes, you know, uh, it covers all the things under the same membrane. Like you can have your request and response, like 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 a REST-based API. You can uh, stream it from the client. You can stream it from the server. You can do the bi-directional streaming. Plus, there is support for all these, uh, you know, programming languages. And yeah, it's it's basically platform neutral. So that's that's a few things. Yeah, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, your topic generated quite a, a conversation here on the on the thread. So I like very much. I would like to take this one Google dot protobuf dot empty for blank messages. That's yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, we can use uh, this particular uh, proto file, right? And basically have that in our uh, GRPC methods, but it will be considered as an anti pattern. Uh, the reason is that let's say you have that uh, empty parameter in your uh, GRPC stuff, and at later point of time, you want to add one parameter to it. That is something which will not be possible. But you, if you include a message, right? Right, and it uh, and uh, you add one field to that message, you are not going to break your previous version. But you, but the moment you include your Google dot empty, and at later point of time you add uh, another message as a parameter, it is going to break the first client. All Thank right, you. Clear. Now, all good with gRPC, but what are the downsides, if any? Yeah, of course, uh, there are downsides. Uh, one thing I have noticed is the maintainability of it, like, and especially for those who have worked on WCF before, and they would be in a zone that they don't want to, you know, keep their hands uh, dirty on WCF anymore. And the reason is that, you know, there is a lot of boilerplate things which goes on, right? You have to share these contracts to the, to you know, to your, uh, uh, to your clients and when you are upgrading your service right and you need to have all those test cases to make sure that all your versions are compatible or your previous versions are compatible right and 
how you are going to uh, send out your dot proto file to your clients that again becomes a kind of maintainable effort okay i think we have time for one more question and i'm taking the opportunity to salute the guy who asked the question is horatio is a an old friend an of old camp old time friend <laughs> for, for many many years so hello horatio uh and here here is his question uh grpc and signal uh which one uh signal are deserves to uh yeah, yeah, this is grpc or not and not signal signal or, especially in dot net or where the situation where the server needs to ini to initiate the message yeah but i think uh that's that's the same reason because uh again signal in 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 a background it works on your you know uh, web sockets and uh, uh you know your, your other stuff but with 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 grpc you get yeah this uh, extra again benefits of the serialization which is there right mm -hmm. i'm no expert of yeah signal r yeah but probably yeah it, 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 uh, if you have like a couple more minutes you can chat with the guys here on on the on the thread and then continue the conversation because uh, i've seen that there is quite a conversation there so yeah ah, then, okay i'm just scrolling to the chat and probably i will reply yeah, yeah. to it okay okay so goraf thank you so much for being at code camp and yeah thank you so much thank you for having me here. yeah it was a pleasure to be here thank you so much thank you and uh well shall we yeah we we'll take another break 10 minutes and then uh, we come back with the next session stretching refreshments Grabbing a coffee. Grabbing a coffee. Welcome right. back. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye.